Hello and welcome to the Friday, November 18th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. Just a quick diary from myself uh, today here at the Internet Storm Center. And uh, that's about, uh, well, not quite security related. It's really sort of availability related. If you're trying to do failover and uh, you're trying to figure out if your connection is up and running, well, uh, ping is sort of your go-to utility. Turns out not a working utility if you are using T-Mobile's 5G home service as a backup as I'm doing here. Well, well, it turns out that T-Mobile does filter all ICMP traffic, including error messages, uh, which uh, can also cause some interesting issues. So just a little bit here for awareness, uh, ISP sometimes don't play nice and definitely uh, don't really play any more by the RFCs than many at hackers. And then we got an interesting vulnerability from Atlassian in its uh, Bitbucket uh, server and uh, data center uh, products. A little bit difficult uh, to figure out how severe this issue is. And that's something that you probably have to figure out yourself. Uh, Atlassian only rates it as low, but it is an arbitrary code execution vulnerability. However, it does require authentication and does require that the user is able to change their username. But what can then happen is that an environment variable gets set that then leads uh, to operatory code execution. So I imagine a scenario where the user basically changes their username to something that contains shell code that will then be executed. And Mitiga, a company that uh, deals with uh, cloud incidents response, uh, has uh, released a blog post where they looked at leaks of Amazon's RDS snapshots. RDS, uh, that's the relational uh, database service that Amazon offers as part of its uh, AWS offerings. And well, it's a database, of course, uh, with sort of MySQL or Postgres backends. And it has the ability to share a copy of the database as a snapshot. And now that's also done uh, with a regular uh, database. Often you take a snapshot of a database for backup purposes and such. But here, if you aren't careful, the snapshot will be public. Very similar problem as you have with some of these EC2 instances and such, uh, where people People sometimes uh, just are either uh, too lazy to set up the proper access rights for these snapshots or just can't figure out the convoluted permission systems of AWS to only give the correct users access. Same issue here, but here with the relational uh, databases in AWS and apparently uh, Mitiga found a number of cases where uh, these snapshots included uh, personal identifiable information. As so often, the cloud is all nice and fun until you realize there is no perimeter to cover your back in case you're messing up your permissions. And as the holiday season is kicking into a gear here, of course, attackers are following uh, what's going on in the world and are, of course, taking advantage of higher order volumes, shipping problems and the like. And uh, for example, one of our readers in the Slack channel earlier uh, did post an SMS a phishing message that claimed to uh, be a notification about a delayed uh, shipment. But that's not the only thing that's being seen. A security company Sansec is observing a substantial increase in attack against Magento shopping carts. Magento Magento is uh, this famous Adobe plugin that had a rich history of vulnerabilities. And one of uh, these particular vulnerabilities here, a template issue, uh, has uh, been exploited heavily this last month. Uh, they say they've seen uh, more attacks against this vulnerability last month than the entire year uh, before. This is uh, something that you definitely should address now. I know a lot of uh, sort of e-commerce shops and such uh, will have some kind of uh, code freeze and such uh, coming up. Uh, make sure that your e-commerce soft software Magento or what else you're using is up to date now or well, you'll pay for it later. 
And I know for uh, many stores, it may already be uh, too late as they're already in that uh, code freeze phase. Well, it's Friday again, and after a break here of a couple of months, we do have another uh, sans.edu student with us to talk about a research paper. Antonio uh, Piazza, can you please introduce yourself? Thanks for having me. Uh, I'm Antonio Piazza. I just recently graduated from Sands Technical Institute with the Masters of Science in Information Security Engineering, which is exciting, awesome program, and i um, super glad that I took it. Um, I learned so much. I, I honestly tell everyone I, I get a lot of questions about you know the program, and I, and I always brag about it because I, I honestly, in two years, I can't believe how much I learned. So super excited to be done though and have a break because I worked really hard. Yeah. I also, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm married. I uh, have five children. I'm a purple team lead at NVIDIA right now. Uh, most of my background is in red teaming. So offensive security engineering. I've uh, been doing that um, for about five years now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, I guess, you know, with uh, all that going on, uh, Sansa E was a little bit of refuge, kind of other things to do. Uh, <laughs> you, you also had to uh, write a research paper. So uh, yeah. let's introduce that. Let's talk a little bit about you know, what what was the topic here that that you wrote about. The topic is about the gatekeeper user override, and what that is is that basically gatekeeper. Uh, I mean, I can go into more detail what that is, but it's a Mac OS security feature and the override is built in and it's on purpose where, you know, Apple allows the user to um, basically get around gatekeeper by right clicking an application to open it rather than double clicking. Uh, so this research was to dig in and find out if there was a good detection that I could build uh, to alert someone that, you know, alert our, our uh, security people that, you know, someone has just right clicked and overrode a security feature. Yeah, so Gatekeeper uh, was introduced, I think, sort of three or four versions of Mac OS ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, basically, you can limit that only digitally signed software or software downloaded from the App Store is being uh, allowed to be executed. Uh, but there is this uh, simple overwrite uh, that basically, you know, kind of invalidates the feature. And you had some examples where actually malware instructs the user uh, to do just that. So can you mm -hmm. describe how can a user execute uh, software that just downloaded uh, even with Gatekeeper in place? With Gatekeeper in place, um, when a user downloads an application or a file, um, if they normal, if you if they try to open it as normal by double clicking it, they're going to get a uh, pop up that says that you know. Well, if if the application is not um, signed uh, by a, a developer ID and and or if it is not notarized by Apple, the user will get a pop-up notifying that this application is not signed or not notarized. And um, it only gives you the option to um, cancel or move the file to the trash. Now, after you do that, after you double click to open it and you click cancel, if the user simply right clicks and opens, they'll get the pop-up again, but this time with the option to actually open the file or the application. So it overrides the feature uh, and allows the user to execute unsigned or unnotarized applications. So simple right click, and there isn't really any setting or so that would prevent that from happening. Or uh... Uh, no, I mean there there is settings to where you can really lock down your Mac um, by saying do not allow any application to be opened unless it was specifically downloaded from the app store. But, you know, in an enterprise environment, that's probably not going to be set because it's too restrictive. And there's lots of reasons why a user should be able to execute an application that doesn't come from the app store. But other than that, there's no, um, you know, Mac OS uh, system settings to, to prevent that from happening. Right, it, it would definitely be restrictive. And I remember myself using a Mac, also often using that bypass. And if I download some random software, I really want to uh, execute. Kind of. But right. uh, so your approach was, well, we can't prevent it. Uh, at least we want mm -hmm. to log it. Uh, so at least we want to know yeah. uh, what users are clicking. Uh, what do you find? Uh, was that possible? And how did you go about that? 
Yeah, um, it is possible to detect. Um, and the way you go about it, well, I can talk a little bit about how I conducted the research. I looked at two different things. One, I looked at Apple's unified log system. The other one, I looked at the Apple endpoint security framework um, event messages. Now, back in, uh, I think it was Catalina, uh, Mac OS Catalina, uh, Apple kicked everyone out of the kernel. So basically what used to be, there used to be called kernel extensions or kext files, um, which allowed, um, you know, developers to hook into the kernel. Well, they kicked everyone out and said, nobody's going to be in the kernel anymore. We're going to give you what's called a system extension, which will give you access to certain kernel features, but we're going to really restrict what that is. So they came up with um, endpoint security framework for our security vendors, for our EDRs. And basically that's just a bunch of log messages that deal strictly with security properties. Um, so I wanted to take a look at that and I wanted to take a, a look at the unified log system um, and see if, you know, there was a difference between uh, a user double clicking to open an application versus right clicking to open an application. If there was any difference in the logs or any difference in the uh, endpoint security or ESF um, uh, messages. And I didn't find, unfortunately didn't find anything in the ESF or endpoint security framework messages, but I did find something interesting in the unified log. So um, that's, that was how I, you know, using that, what I found the unified log is uh, in my research papers, how I described how you can actually build a detection. Yeah. And basically you just ingest that into your seam and can write rules around it to basically alert if a user. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's correct. You can, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. You can, um, you can basically Apple's got the built in log um, uh, tool or log uh, uh binary that uh, there's there has a couple different functions log show which will show you logs that are stored on the system and um, log stream which actually allows you to stream the logs as as things are happening and you can actually use the uh, you know log stream uh, function to stream out to your sim I, I, I the example that I give in my research paper is doing it um, using I think uh, log beats in the uh, the elk stack. Hmm. Yeah, th that's a great research. So again, the paper uh, is in our uh, reading room, I think we call it these days, and or have always called it. Uh, but uh, a link will also be in the show notes. Uh, yeah, thanks, Anthony, for uh, joining me here. Uh, what are you now doing with all of your free time after you're done uh, playing with your kids or... Oh yeah, I uh, my wife always. Um, it's funny when I was, you know, we were discussing it coming to the end of uh, this program and me graduating, what I was going to do with my free time, and she she laughed. She said, "No, I'm sure you'll find something else to keep you busy um, <laughs> other than spending time with the family." But uh, no, I, I definitely plan to spend more time, and I have spent more time with the kids and uh, you know some of their sports and extracurricular functions that I was missing for the last couple of years. So, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks for joining me here and thanks to everybody listening. Now, next week, actually, I'll do something completely different. I'll uh, take the entire week off and there will be no podcast. There will still be a Packet Tuesday that already uh, got uh, recorded, but unless there is some uh, big event, uh, no podcast next week for the Thanksgiving uh, week here in the US. Thanks for listening and talk to you again in Monday in a week. Bye.